Blog Talk Radio. There's a call comes ringing for the restless waves and the light. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to the Gospel Light. Radio show. Your host this evening is Stevie R. Butler with my co host Tim Bench from the state of Texas, Glenn McMillian from the state of Texas, Robert Lee Johnson from the state of Georgia, Courtney Carruthers from the state of Illinois, Steve Cordell from the state of Florida, Patrick Medlock from the state of Florida, Willie Williams III from the state of Texas, Jason Lieber. From the state of Kentucky. Ladies and gentlemen, we're grateful that you are tuning into our radio broadcast this evening. This radio show is brought to you by loving and faithful members of the Churches of Christ. We would ask that you would take out your Bibles and study along with us. We have a very exciting show planned for your spiritual enlightenment and your edification. If you would like to contact us while we are on the air this evening, you can give us a call to the live show at 713 713- Nine five five zero five zero eight. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns for any of my co-hosts, you can send us an email to srbutler1009 at yahoo.com. Or you can call the Carolina studio at 910-491-6405. Now, again, this program is brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. If you need any assistance in locating a congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks, get out your Bibles and study along with us here on the Gospel Light Radio Show. the world listening to this radio broadcast stevie b's media production presents the gospel light radio show i'm your host this evening stevie r butler and this radio show is being broadcast from the carolina studio in the great state of north carolina ladies and gentlemen we are just so grateful to be able to bring you a program where we as christians and members of the Churches of Christ can share our faith and preach and teach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ on a weekly basis. So before we go into our program for this evening, I would ask that you would bow with me in a word of prayer that we may thank God for this opportunity. Our most kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for allowing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our hearts that we are on this broadcast and we are prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, we pray that you would be with my co-host on the show this evening, Jason Lieber and Willie Williams III, as they break unto us the bread of life. Father, we pray that You'll continue to bless them in their efforts and bless their families as they support them as they sow the seed of the kingdom. Father, we pray that you would bless our listeners this evening. We pray that they may listen well and that their hearts may be pricked that will cause them to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you so much for sending your only begotten son to die such a cruel death on Calvary's cross. Father, we recognize that without such a sacrifice, we would not even have a hope of eternal life. Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless us and keep us and love us all the days of our lives. And if we have been faithful unto death, Father, we pray that you would save us. For us in Christ's blessed name, we do ask it all. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Our speakers for the program this evening will be in the first segment. My co-host, Jason Lieber, will be making his presentation of the Gospel of Christ. And in the second segment, I have some questions 
from my Shout It Out platform on social media, Facebook, that I'll be posing to my co-host. And then in the last segment of the broadcast, my co-host, Willie Williams III, will be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ to close out the show. So open your Bibles now and open your minds and let's have a great show. Enjoy the show. Road, Jordan Road, Road, Jordan Road, Road, Jordan Road. I want to go to heaven when I die. Road, Jordan Road, Road, Jordan Road, Road, Jordan Road. I want to go to heaven when I die. To bend there. Oh, mother, you are to bend there. Oh, mother, you are to bend there. been there. Oh, Father, you ought to have been there. Oh, Father, you ought to have been there. Oh, Lord, 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 oh, you ought to have been there. Oh, sister, you ought to have been there. Well, sister, you ought to have been there. To roll your
show. Now my co-host, Jason Lieber, and his subject, Rethinking the Church. It's great to uh, be on uh, this radio show this evening. I want to thank Stevie again uh, for putting this all together. I want to thank all of the co-hosts that are here this uh, together this evening as we uh, answer questions and to teach the Word of God. I want to thank all you listeners for being out there and tuning in as we talk about things that are important and that have eternal consequences. I want to uh, start off with a poem uh, this evening called A Father's Prayer. A tear dropped crept into my eye as I knelt on bended knee, next to a gold-haired tiny lad whose age was just past three. He prayed with such simplicity, please make me big and strong, just like Daddy, don't you see? Watch o'er me all night long. Jesus, make me tall and brave, like my daddy next to me. This simple prayer he prayed tonight filled my heart with humility as I heard his voice so, excuse me, <clears throat> as I heard his voice so we and small offer his prayer to God, I thought these little footsteps someday my path may trod. O oh Lord, as I turn my eyes above and guidance ask from thee, Keep my walk ever so straight for the little feet that follow me. Buoy me when I stumble and lift me when I fall, fail. Guard the, this tiny bit of a boy as he travels down life's trail. Make me what he thinks I am is my humble, gracious plea. Help me ever be the man this small lad sees in me. What a great little poem to, to show that the father wants to see himself as his young son does. He wants to also live up to his expectations so that he can be the Christian uh, that uh, God would have him to be, to be the good example unto this little, his little son. Now, once again, the father wants to see himself as his young son does. It motivates him to live up to that view. In our lesson tonight, I want us to look at a viewpoint, at a perspective. Although it is not between father and son per se, it is between uh, 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 Christian and the church. How do, how do Christians view the church? And not only Christians, but even non-Christians. This is important for us uh, to get. Uh, if Christians need a look at the church the right way. And so uh, do non-Christians. It could stop uh, a non-Christian uh, from uh, being saved, and it can even stop one who is already saved. Um, uh, uh, they could lose their salvation if they don't have the correct viewpoint, if they don't have God's viewpoint uh, of the church. And so that's what I want us to do this evening. I want to say call this rethinking the church because sometimes – uh, people's perspective can be flawed of the church. And so uh, that's what I want us to do this evening is go to Scripture and see what God has to say about the church. I want to do that by looking at Haggai chapter 2, and we're going to look together at verses 1 through 9 in Haggai chapter 2. And it reads, In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all of you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more... It is a little while. I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. 
and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Just a little bit of a historical background uh, before we get into the text, uh, understanding it uh, uh, as it applies to the church. Uh, there, uh, the, the nation of Israel has come out of uh, captivity, and they are rebuilding the temple, but it doesn't quite live up to the standard that the temple once was. And for some people, this is discouraging. Uh, but God says not to be. For even in the future, there is yet a, there is still a greater temple to come, and in this, he is talking about the church. And so this is a prophecy in regards to Jesus coming and establishing the church, building his church, which in the New Testament we do read is, is a temple. We can read that in Ephesians. We can also read that in, uh, in Peter's epistles. And um, we can read that other places in the New Testament, those two in particular. And this is important because there are two things I want to focus on in this lesson so that we can have the proper perspective of the church. So let's let's look at verses 7 through 9 again. Let's, let's look at that a little bit closer. It says, I will fill this temple with glory. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, and in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Those are the those are the the, wor the words in, in verses seven to nine that I want us to focus on. From these promises of God, we will see His view of the church. God views the church as His temple, full of glory and a place of peace. What does this mean um, for, in particular for Christians, but also to help non-Christians see what the church is? And how does this help us rethink the church? Well, let me, let's talk about this uh, together. You know, when you pull up uh, to the church building, and of course I'm not talking about the church, but just pull up to the church building, do you see it as a courtroom? Claire's you guilty of sin? When standards are taught, do you leave the assembling feeling like a beat-up, no-account sinner? Let us look once again at what the Lord says about the church. He says, I will fill this temple with glory. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. What does glory mean here when God is talking about uh, the church? Uh, well, it means a state of high honor. For this reason, we must view the teaching of standards not simply as a gavel being slammed down to seal our fate of going to hell if we do not practice them, but just as important as a judgment of right and wrong to empower us to live up to the glorious and honorable position that God has placed Christians in the church. But also he is calling all people to glory. He wants all people to be a part of this state of honor. From this balanced perspective, we can view the teaching of standards as something positive, not negative. Sometimes people uh, look at God's commands and uh, they think they're burdensome. They they think that uh, even, even people in the church sometimes when a standard is taught, a standard maybe they're not that familiar with, a standard that they think is too restrictive. Uh, what they do is, is they get upset, and they lash back out at the speaker. But we have to understand, if that person is in fact teaching the truth, they shouldn't just feel guilty about it. They shouldn't be insulted about it because God has placed the church in a state of high honor. The church is the people of God who have been raised up in glory to live in glory. And so… God's people need to be peculiar, and so that means teaching standards, and it means that we need to keep those standards. And so whether you're saved or unsaved, the church does place restrictions on people 
or should, the teachings that are in it, if the place that you're going to is the pillar and ground of truth, so really teaching the truth about how we should live and how we should speak and talk and the views that we should have on certain things in this uh, in regards to what goes on in the world. And so uh, if, in fact, you are hearing that truth and you reject it, you're rejecting the position of high honor. You are rejecting glory that God wants you to be in, that high, that, that glory. So think about the honor and the glory and the integrity that the church is, needs to, to exhibit in, in her daily choices, both in words and actions. So I, I want to ask you, do you see that? Do you see God's perspective to see that? We need to understand that standards are taught and need to be kept. It's not just about feeling guilty and keeping them so we don't go to hell. It's so that we can be and be, portray that honorable position that God places people in when they are saved, when they have been baptized into Christ. And so moving on, though, let us rethink some more. I want to, you to see to, to picture a church building out in the country. And this church building is surrounded by storm clouds. As the storm comes in, the wind starts to blow and the thunder rolls. As you approach this church building, would it not be a place of refuge? Well, of course it would be. Now, that's physical refuge. But what about spiritual refuge? Should we think of the church assembling together in a building as a place of spiritual refuge? Well, I believe, of course, the answer is yes. But we need to further qualify it. In more words, do we view the assembling of ourselves together in a building, and I'm talking about the church, as the only opportunity throughout the week to find refuge from the negativity in the world? Well, let us look to Peter and Paul to answer whether the church should view themselves that way. And, of course, once again, non-Christians, how should you view the church? Let's think about this. Let's let's turn together to uh, First Peter, and I encourage you to get out your Bibles if you have it with you. First Peter, chapter five, and we're going to read verses six through seven, and it reads: Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. And that it says, casting all your care upon God. Some translations read uh, all your anxieties upon God. Let's also look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And here we read, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with Thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, Peter writes, cast all your care upon him, not cast care, care, your care up upon the church. And Paul writes, the Lord is at hand, not the church is at hand. Now, let me say this carefully. Listen carefully. Do not get me wrong. Meeting together as the church, is one of the ways we can find peace in a chaotic world. And what I'm about to say does not mean we should, that we should make some excuse and say, well, I'm not going to assemble this week. I'm feeling pretty good about life. Of course not. We should assemble regularly with the Lord's people. However, we should not believe that when we assemble that that is the only place that we can get peace. That we're just waiting for that next time to come around. And in all honesty, sometimes we may be weak. We may be going through discouragement and difficulty. And we really need to be there to get that peace. But you know, sometimes it's us that are the strong ones. You know, certain individuals are strong and they go in there and they encourage the other people. And so, so we need, it needs to be there. But I also want us to get this. The Lord is everywhere. Not just in a church building when saints come together. Now, even further, why is this important to understand? Why do we need to, to, to get this? Well, again, the Lord says, And in this place I will give peace. Going back to Haggai chapter 2. 
You see, we are the church or temple of God wherever we are. As an individual, I am most certainly not the church collective. I'm not saying that. But in the community, uh, those of you who are listening who are Christians, whatever church you belong to, in that community, you, uh, that group is the church in that community. Uh, whether we are assembled at the building or not, and for those of you who are not Christians, it just teaches you you don't have to go to a church building and to be saved. You can be saved anywhere uh, just as long as uh, you're doing what the, the, the gospel teaches and just as that you can be saved anywhere. Uh, now, therefore, Hagar is teaching we are – that the church is to be a place of peace as individuals in the community and collectively in the assembly. Now, what does peace mean here in Haggai? It means a har harmonious relations and freedom from disputes, especially during the absence of war. Friends, we cannot be at peace with others when our hearts are not guarded by God's peace everywhere. Have you ever heard someone pray something similar to this in the assembly? Help us cast all our cares and worldly thoughts away so we can solely focus on you and your word. Now, this is a great prayer, and I don't know what everybody means when they pray it, but we just need to know this is not only for when we're in the church building, but everywhere. This is a prayer that we need to have, need to ask. God desires that we depend on him at all times in order to have a clear sober and ready mind. We must not let worry and anxiety captivate us in order to be prepared to deal with others peacefully. If we are not experiencing the protection of God's peace, we cannot be at peace with others. We cannot have a calming influence over others. We cannot exhibit self-control when we have to rebuke someone. We will not be able to share the hope of the gospel in a meek and humble way. Our relationships will not be harmonious because of us, but full of tension and strife because of us. So we are to be a place of peace, certainly collectively, but also as individuals wherever we are. Now do you see the vision of, that God has of the church? From Haggai chapter 2, what is the church then? And rethinking this, I pray you see how Haggai's teaching leads us to the, this conclusion that I'm about to give. Being the church is not about rules and regulations meant to restrict us from having a good time. Being the church is about being in a high position of honor. That is why standards need to and must be taught. Also, we are people, the church, we are people who are a place of peace, not people who have always – that always need to assemble to find that peace. We can get it wherever we are as long as we go to the Lord and ask him to guard our hearts uh, from the cares of this world. Now, if you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, consider this, that, that this is a great blessing to have the Lord to go to so that we can be at peace in our walk in this life. And also consider that the standard that the church teaches, that uh, it, it's, it's, it's for righteous living, and it's the best way. It's not to be viewed as restrictions. And those of us who are already in the church, let's, let's look at ourselves the right way. Let's look at ourselves the way that God wants us to. Wants. I pray this lesson helps you have the correct view of the church, whether you are part of it or not. The Israelites of old did not have the correct view of the temple, and if we are not careful, we may not have the correct view of the church and how sh she should work today. Haggai expands our thinking to elevate our perspective. With this Holy Spirit-inspired viewpoint, we can see the church not as a courtroom one goes to on Sundays – but a state of high honor a Christian lives in every day. With his Holy Spirit-inspired viewpoint, we can see the church not as a refuge where one physically goes to to find peace, but a spiritual family that can always find peace, no matter where they are, what they are doing, and whatever they are going through. If not already, do you want to be in a state of high honor? 
If not already, do you want to have peace no matter where you are and no matter what circumstance you can find yourself in? If so, why not obey the gospel this morning or this evening? Uh, why not do that? Um, you know, you can, you can. Uh, if you ask, need some help, go ask somebody. Say, hey, I need to be baptized into Christ this evening. And find a place to be baptized wherever that is. Maybe, and, and if that's at a church building, go if you have that opportunity. And of course, do that. Uh, you know, call someone up and, and ask them to help you obey the gospel. If you want to talk to somebody about it, talk to a preacher. Call up somebody. And we can help you get in contact with somebody in your area uh, that that is affiliated with the Church of Christ, and we would love uh, for you to obey the gospel and, and seeing the church the way that uh, that that God does, and uh, believing in Jesus as deity incarnate when He was here, and and that He died for you, raised for you, ascended for you, and you, and you need to come to repent and confess and be baptized. If you need to do that, don't wait. Give your life to Jesus, your Lord, God, Savior, and Redeemer. Repent of your sin. Confess your faith in Jesus. Now, uh, if, if you're already a Christian, but you know you just haven't had the right view, and you're kind of throwing off the restrictions, and you think you can live on the edge and how you want to, think about this lesson, and think about what God, how God sees the church, which would mean how he sees you if you're already a Christian. And so thank you for this opportunity uh, to, to teach uh, this lesson, Stevie, again. And thank you for all you listeners. And take this lesson with you, please. And and uh, if you have any questions about it, as Stevie said, you can you can call in, and we'll we'll be willing to help you uh, understand um, what what has already been taught and what will continue to be taught throughout the night. God bless. May God bless all of you as uh, you uh, are living. Um, the way that you should in, in Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity again, Stevie. Good night. When God said no, and we won't insist to the age, just remember, don't forget, Father knows, Father knows what's best. When I lay awake at night, the tears streaming from I remember, God, I know, know what's best, yeah, 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 yeah. my God, God he, knows he knows what's best, what's best. Late in the midnight hour, I was crying and all alone, waiting for an answer. My whole gone. I even called on my best friend, and she could not be found. Lord, you said you'll never leave me nor forsake me. Lord, where are you now? So I went to church the next Sunday morning, looking for my breakthrough. I knew a change would come if I just hold on, cause God's word is true. But then the preacher said something, and it took me by surprise. Sometimes God says no, but just like Job, you gotta trust him, my child. When God says no. When the preacher said it, and I didn't quite understand it. He said, don't forget, don't forget. just trust your father, because he knows what's best. When I lay awake in the middle of the night, with tears streaming from my eyes, I remember, father knows, no matter what you're going through. Cause he knows God, he Father knows what's And I started to feel a little better Cause he started talking about my Jesus And the garden of Gethsemane And how we pray to the Father Let this cup pass from me Then he did just like me, y'all Said he went to his best friend and his friends let him down. He said, my God, my God, why have you forgotten?
forsaken me Where are you now? You see, sometimes God is moving And we don't understand See, Jesus paid the cost When we were lost And it was all a part of God's master plan So when you're waiting for that answer And God says no to you Just go ahead and shout And have no doubt Trust your father Church of Christ will be the official host of the 2019 Florida State Lectureship of the Churches of Christ in conjunction with the Jacksonville, Florida Congregations. The Newburgh Church of Christ, located in Louisville, Kentucky, is currently seeking a full-time minister, so please submit all inquiries to the NewburghCOC at gmail.com. Candidates will be forwarded a job description and application packet Complete application should be submitted along with the candidate's resume, references, and doctrinal philosophy and a sample of an audio or video recording sermon. On November the 24th through the 25th, 2018, the 25th anniversary celebration will be held at the East Glen Park Church of Christ. And that address is 505 East 45th Street Avenue, Gary, Indiana. And the theme for their uh Celebration will be a joyful celebration in spiritual songs. On Sunday, November 25th, worship will be at 10.15 a.m. There will be an anniversary dinner served at 12.30 p.m. And there will be a program at 2.30 p.m. Guest speaker will be James Burris from the Hippie Street Church of Christ in Jackson, Mississippi. And guest song leader will be Joseph Hope from Los Angeles, California. For more information, please call 291 884-8405. On November the 30th through December the 1st, 2018, the 34th Annual Ladies' Conference will be held at the Southside Church of Christ. And that address is 800 Ellsmer Avenue, Durham, North Carolina, 27707. And the theme will be First Things First, Matthew 633, Mission Possible. And the keynote speaker will be Mary Carter, from the Gold Hill Church of Christ. For more details, please visit the website at www.sside.org. On November the 17th through the 22nd, 2018, the 2018 Southwestern Christian College Lectureship will be held in Turrell, Texas. On March the 21st through the 24th, 2019, the Millennial Reach Collaborative presents God's Plan Millennial Reach Conference, and that address will be at the Marriott at the Miami Airport at 1201 Northwest Lejeune Road, Miami, Florida, 33126. For more information or registration, visit their website at www.reach.com or give them a call at 228-331-3324. On January the 20th through the 24th, 2019, 
the New Golden Heights Church of Christ will be hosting their 43rd Annual Ministers Institute. And the theme of this uh, conference will be the case for the Holy Spirit. And that address is 2051 Northwest 31st Avenue, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33311. And that telephone number for more information will be 954-735-2907. On November the 22nd through the 24th, 2018, the National Academy Christian Acapella Music Awards will be held at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Jacksonville, Florida. On Saturday, November the 24th, 2018, the Nakamo 2018 Saturday Matinee will be featuring Straight Company and Dorian Paul Williams. For more information, visit the website at nakamo.com. On December the 3rd and the 4th, 2018, the Newburgh Church of Christ will be hosting their homecoming, and their theme will be From Glory to Glory. And that address is 4700 East Indian Trail, Louisville, Kentucky, 40216. For more information, please call 502-966-5171. And the guest speaker will be Des Anderson, and that will be the Saturday concert featuring Genesis McClendon Archer and live from Jacksonville, Florida. And a programming announcement, Stevie B's Media Production presents, we're airing live shows here on Blog Talk Radio, and the first Monday of every month, we're doing a special edition show here on the Gospel Light Radio Show, and we try to use that show for uh, special topics requested from our listeners. On Tuesday, each week, we're airing a live show from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, hosting the live show, What a Word, from the Lord Radio Show. And each week we have guest speakers from the Churches of Christ, the Brotherhood of the Churches of Christ, will be presenting lessons from the Word of God. We also have the Community Corner, that's segments for small business owners and entrepreneurs who have products and services that they're offering to our communities. We also have my co-host, Edward Bishop, from Niagara Falls, New York will be presenting a lesson from the Word of God as well. On Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm hosting a live show, the Gospel Light Radio Show. And on this broadcast, I have eight co-hosts who will be presenting lessons from the Word of God. And each week, I have two co-hosts on the air. And we're also taking some questions from my Shout It Out platform on social media, Facebook. And I'll be posing few of these questions to my co-host on the broadcast. And then on Friday night from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm hosting a live show, Stevie B's Acapella Gospel Music Blast radio show. The first week of each month, we have the Story Glory segment where we're interviewing artists. We're also debuting new music and featuring old music on this broadcast and the second week my daughter Tati B she's my co-host and she's doing my whole playlist on that show and the third week we're doing the top 20 countdown show and the fourth week we're doing the talent search show I give my listeners 60 seconds to stand on the world stage and sing their song first and second place prizes will be awarded by my special guest judges Also, once a quarter, we're doing the Marathon Show. That's a three-hour show of whatever artist or group that we're featuring on that show. And we're just playing their music on that show. And if you are an artist and you have music that you would like for me to be playing on my radio show, you can send me your MP3 formatted tracks via Dropbox. And my email address is srbutler1009 at yahoo.com. You can now listen to all of these shows, on-demand episodes, through my affiliate internet stations. You can listen through Spotify, through iHeartRadio, through iTunes, through ACARadio.net, through iWave Radio, through World of Acapella, through MCCBroadcasting.com, through IBCBroadcasting.com, through YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel, Stevie R. Butler, a.k.a. Stevie B., 
and you'll be able to see all those on-demand episodes, audio clips. Also through Church TV Network, search their playlist for Acapella Radio, and you'll be able to see the audio, the audio clips as well. I want to thank my sponsors, Sharon Norwood from Chicago, Illinois, and her business is Organo, and their company's slogan is a health product for healthier living. And Yvonne Blazing Cracker Gooch, she lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Certainly appreciate our sponsors for this program. And the three E's of Stevie B's media production, it is the objective of this broadcast to educate, to edify, and to encourage you in the Word of God. And that will conclude our programming announcements. There's a land beyond the river That we call the sweet forever And we only reach that shore by faith's decree One by one we'll gain the portal There to dwell with the immortal When they ring those golden bells For you and me There's a land There's a land beyond the river that we call forever, and we only, and we only reach that shore reach by faith decree. Faith decree, faith decree, faith decree. In that far, in that far, sweet forever. Oh, just beyond, just beyond the shining river. Oh, when they ring, when they ring the gong, baby. Oh, when they ring, when they ring the gong, baby. Quit. 
I understand. <laughs> whether, I, whether I finish it or not, huh? <laughs> All right, here we go. Right, here's the question. What is the role of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's life today? Please use scripture in re- your response if possible. Now, this question was taken off of the Gospel Herald uh, Facebook group. I was, uh, I don't know if someone requested that I ask this question mm-hmm. on the show. It's from Mike Yarborough. I don't know where Mike is from. Okay. I understand. All right. Well, uh, I'm ready to get started. Let's go. All right. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to say it's a great question. And it is a question that comes up often. Uh, we see it all of the time. It is a question that uh, others have answered uh, over and over again. The giants among us have answered uh, this question. Uh, they get their answer from the Bible. And I will say that it is a question that many of the giants have differed on uh, from time to time. But it is a question that we need to consider seriously, and it is a question that we need to, uh, you know, be very uh, careful about trying to answer it. And once we think we have the answer from the Word of God, I don't think that we should be uh, dogmatic in in dealing with the issue. But uh, the heart of this, I believe, deals with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And some people say, well, if he is in us, what does he do for us? And others uh, take a different approach, though he is in us, but he is there uh, the same as God is in us, the same as Christ is in us. Uh, and so I think that to look at it in that particular sense might be looking at it in the right way. And so the indwelling of the Holy Spirit intersects with other facets of studying about the Holy Spirit, such as reviewing the divine nature of the Holy Spirit, considering the relationship of the Word of God to the Holy Spirit, noticing the work of the Holy Spirit, analyzing the interjection of the Holy Spirit at the household of Cornelius, and most certainly examining the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Strictly speaking, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit among Cornelius, uh, his family, his friends, do not really concern the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. However, erroneous denominational interpretations connect uh, the miraculous display of Acts 2 and Acts 10 to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they must be considered and explained to when treating the subject of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Truly, there is no area of scrutiny when studying the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that does not materially affect virtually every other aspect of studying about the Holy Spirit. For instance, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit has an impact on the understanding of Acts 2 and verse number 38, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, blaspheming and sinning against the Holy Spirit, and seal in and the intercession of the Holy Spirit. Perception of the manner in which the Holy Spirit indwells the Christian is fundamentally related to one's view of every other facet of the Holy Spirit. It cannot be overemphasized that every author, preacher, or Bible class teacher's explanation of the manner in which the Holy Spirit indwells the child of God completely controls or colors the rest of his teaching about the Holy Spirit. And so that's why I said earlier we need to be careful about it. Now, Let us look briefly at the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. John 6 and verse number 63. Uh, The uh, person who raised the question wanted scripture. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. 
we read in Romans 8, 9 through 16, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Uh, Acts 2, 38 and 39 uh, there we we read where Peter says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 5 and verse number 32, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.16 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Galatians 3, 2, uh, Galatians 4, 6, Ephesians 5, 18, and 19, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Uh, 1 John 4 and verse number 13, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his... And so those are just uh, scriptures that we uh, refer to when we talk about uh, the Holy Spirit and his indwelling. Now, look at the indwelling of God, the indwelling of Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Word of God, and the, and the indwelling of man, 2 Corinthians six sixteen. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace uh, in your hearts to the Lord. And so a number of scriptures says the Spirit indwells us, that God indwells us, that Christ indwells us. And I just like to say, uh, the Holy Spirit does not indwell us differently than God does, or Christ, uh, or the Word of God. I think we have to be knowledgeable of that. And so how does the indwelling occur? The question is not only how does the Holy Spirit indwell the Christian, but how does indwelling occur? Remember, God, Jesus Christ, and the Word dwell within the Christian along with the Holy Spirit. Further, the Christian dwells in God, too. So the question is not how does the Holy Spirit indwell the child of God, but how does the indwelling occur? Ascertaining from Scripture how indwelling occurs, we answer at the same time. How does the word indwell in man? How does God dwell in man? How does Christ dwell in man? How does man dwell in the Godhead? And how does the Holy Spirit dwell in the, the child of God? Jesus Christ dwells within the Christian through faith, Ephesians 3.17. Think about it, friends. Christ is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. God is in us. And and so do they dwell in us differently? I don't think so. I think that it is through the same manner uh, that um, we are to to understand the dwelling. And then let me conclude because I know Stephen can to pull my chain. A personal, literal, literal, or bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit in man is not explicitly taught in the Bible. A personal, literal, or bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit would serve no purpose whatsoever. Instead, a personal, literal, or bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit would supplant the medium of the Holy Spirit's operation today, which is through the Word of God and personal, literal, uh, literal or bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit would not facilitate the work of the Holy Spirit today either. And so a personal, literal, or bodily indwelling of the Spirit, since there is no evidence to su suggest God or Christ dwells in man differently from the Spirit, would demand that God and Christ also personally, literally, or bodily indwell the Christian. So is God in us literally? Is Christ in us literally? Uh, is the Holy Spirit in us literally? And I think not. Uh, I think that that is not the case. As I conclude, I'd just like to quote two or three men 
Uh, Frank LeCamp says the proposition that the Holy Spirit works only through the word is one that has stood the test on the polemic platform for more than 150 years. Uh, then we hear our uh, one of my favorite ministers, Guy and Wood, it seems certain that God Christ and the Holy Spirit dwell in the hearts of faithful disciples in exactly the same manner through the word of truth. He can, uh, he who can see a personal, literal, and actual indwelling in the words, the Spirit dwelleth in you, but nothing more than a representative indwelling in the words, God dwelleth in him, First John 4, 15, has abandoned all reasonable exegesis. The Holy Spirit dwells in Christians today through the word which he inspires. So whatever the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is capable of doing uh, to the Christian, it is done through the word of Almighty God. Thank you so much. I appreciate your patience. I hope I was able to help out just a little bit. Brother, God that bless was you. very that was that was very thorough. Certainly appreciate that response to that question. Okay, we're not gonna have a break now. We're gonna go ahead and go into this second question here, uh, for the sake of time. Okay, let me go ahead and go to Glenn. Glenn's out in the state of Texas. How you doing, my brother? I'm doing all right. How are you? All right, you ready for this hardball question? <laughs> <laughs> sure, let's go All right, now this question is from an anonymous query It's from the state of Illinois And the question is If the Church of Christ is teaching That women should not work outside of the home Would this be biblical? And the scriptural reference that we have for this question Is First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14 And that text says I will therefore that the younger women marry Bear children, guide the home, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachful. What say you to this question? Well, first of all, uh, the first part of the question is if the Church of Christ teaches that. Um, I've been in the church for 38 years, and I've never heard anybody teach that, that women are not allowed to work outside the home. So. Uh, as a general rule, the Church of Christ, as far as I know, that are no congregation that I've ever been a part of teaches that. But if a, a congregation, I, I, and that's not to say that there is no congregation out there that does not teach that, because if you look hard enough, you can find a congregation that teaches anything. But um, if if a congregation were to, to teach that, I don't believe that that would necessarily be in line with Scripture. Uh, taking that particular Scripture out of context, uh, you know, Paul is giving a general list of guidelines that should be that are for good conduct for women in our in especially specifically he's talking about widows who who lost their husbands at a young age that they should what they should be looking to do in order to stay focused on doing the work of God and and He's concerned about these widows losing focus, having a lot of idle time, being a burden on other people, specifically being a burden on the church. Um, and so he's he's encouraging them to take care of themselves, number one, by going out and, and getting remarried and, and reestablishing a lifestyle so that they can get back to – uh, doing the the work that God has has called them to do that that includes bearing children and and taking care of the home, but it's not those are not things that are requirements uh, for someone for for a woman to be saved. You're you would say in order to for the, that to be a requirement, you would basically be saying that no single uh, woman could could come to Christ because. Paul says that women are saved through childbearing, and this in this passage says that uh, women are required to have children. So that that's not that's taking uh, a, a step too far uh, away from a reasonable understanding of the scripture. Uh, basically, what what the scripture is saying is just these are good guidelines. These are things that you should are are good for. Uh, Christian women to pursue as opposed to things that they would get into if they were not uh, following a similar path. 
And we also know that uh, one of the first Gentile converts was Lydia, who was a seller of purple. She had a business outside of the home, and there's no indication in the scripture that she was ever told to abandon her business in order to uh, get married or do something else with her life. Uh, so it, there's there's nothing in scripture that says that these are hard and fast rules that are requirements that someone has to do in order to be saved, and a, a reasonable look at these these uh these scriptures makes it clear that these are guidelines for good living they are not necessarily requirements or something that has to be done in order to to qualify for salvation All and i don't right, think there's Glenn. any reasonable church of christ that that teaches that All right Glenn thank you for that response. Let's go to Tim in the state of Texas. All right, Tim, if the Church of Christ is teaching that women should not work outside the home, would this be biblical? What say you to this question? This is a great question. Unlike Glenn, I do know a couple of people within a certain church who would say that, yes, it is absolutely uh, not biblical, but let's look at that in some detail. The Bible does have very specific instructions regarding the role of women, and I want us to look at that very quickly. First, uh, first we got Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 3 through 5. In the same way, instruct the older women to behave as women who should live a holy life. They must not be slanderers or slaves to wine. They must teach what is good in order to train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, to be good housewives, who submit themselves to their husbands so that no one will speak evil of the message that comes from God. And that's the end of the verses, but that gives a very good specific overview of what a woman's domestic duties are. That continues, 1 Timothy chapter 5, which is the basis of this question, and it's interesting, in that verse, it talks specifically about taking care of their homes. So again, we have the sentiment echoed or repeated that that is a, a primary responsibility of a woman. Now, let's look at the responsibilities to earn a living. From 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So again, we see that actually providing food, clothing, sustenance for one's household is absolutely uh, important. I think this is what Glenn was alluding to earlier. We've got Proverbs uh, chapter 31, starting in verse 31. We have a woman described who does everything in her power to care for her family, to provide financially for her family. Let's look at that very quickly, because Proverbs makes several mentions of this. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family, portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Quite obviously, this is not just working inside the household. This is not just normal domestic duties, and it's not condemned at all. Proverbs 31.18, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. This woman is working at night. Proverbs 31.24, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. How much more clear can the Bible be about a apparently a worthy, noble, moral woman working to make additional money uh, for her family? So no, to answer the question, it is not condemned in the Bible for a woman to work outside of the house. It is not a moral crime for a woman to work outside of her house, but we need to make an important distinction here. What is important is that a woman not neglect her household duties, and that would go for a man, too. And I think that's what is so important and so many people uh, ignore now. The Bible in no sense ever forbids a woman from working outside the home, but the Bible does teach what a woman's priorities are to be, and that those priorities include home, 
children, family, etc. If working outside the home would cause a woman to neglect her family duties or neglect her children or husband, then it is wrong for that woman to work outside the home. If, however, a Christian woman can work outside the home and still provide a loving, caring, uh, supportive environment, a biblical environment for her children and husband, it is perfectly acceptable for her to work outside the home. Women who work outside the home should not be condemned, and neither should women who focus on the home be treated with condescension. And on occasion, we will see both of those types of viewpoints manifested. So to answer the question, it is absolutely acceptable for a woman to work outside the home, provided she still fulfills her biblically ordained family duties. All right, Tim, thank you for that response. Okay, let's go to Jason in the state of Kentucky. Okay, Jason, (laughs) if the Church of Christ is teaching that women should not work outside the home, would this be biblical? What say you to this question? Well, uh, I I think uh, both Glenn and uh, Tim have covered it it well, Uh, so I guess I'm just kind of here to summarize. (laughs) But I appreciate what they've already said, and... um, you know, one of the things is if a woman is not married, you know, she doesn't have children, well, of course it's not wrong. Definitely not. Uh, if a woman is married, then, as Tim has said, that she has some, some or- God-ordained duties. She needs to keep those. If working outside of the home would cause her to neglect those, then right, she shouldn't do it. Uh, and the same thing for a woman who has children. You know, after you've been married and then you have children, um, you no, know, wouldn't do it if it interferes with that. Uh, and so uh, that that would, um, um, I think that the, that that's what Tim was saying, and very clearly saying, and I would agree with that. And I, I would add just one more little little uh, piece to that. Uh, just need to be careful why, uh, you know. Um, a family would decide that the woman needs to work outside of the home. Um, if it's uh, just so we can have – be wealthier, well, that's uh, – you know, that's different. I think you need to be careful about why you would want to do it. I think motives are going to be a big factor of whether it's right or wrong too. I think there are a lot of situations where it's necessary. Maybe the husband is uh, can't work, doesn't have a job, and the woman can. There's something that she can do outside the home that would help um, – but as Tim mentioned, Proverbs chapter 31, this woman is doing things outside the house, and she is uh, she's a mother. Um, you know, she's not a single woman. So uh, that's the only thing I would add is that you need to ask why why we're doing this, and and it needs to 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 bring glory to God. Maybe a woman would want to work. Maybe they'd want to have more wealth, perhaps because maybe there's maybe uh, they use that to 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 serve. Um, the church in some way. I mean, I mean that. I guess that could be possible. Just have to ask why is the point I'm making, and I think everything else has already been said has been biblical. So I guess that's that's really all I have to say. Thank you. All right, Jason. Thank you for that response, gentlemen. Thank you all for your responses to these questions. Great questions. Great answers from my co-hosts on this broadcast. When we come back from the break, we'll hear a message from Willie Williams III. Thank you for tuning in to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Okay, just sit down. Sit down, sit down. Let me talk to you. It's been a while, but I know trouble's been in your life. The devil's trying to mess with you. But God's trying to bless you. Situations yeah. may cause you to question faith. I know you cry and you work. Tears streaming down your face. But we came to take you the whole long. Hold on, Try your eyes. And run the race. I'm a believer. Jesus still delivers. I remember oh. when I was right there. This is what I have to do. I wasn't worried. That's why I stopped by here to tell you. Keep praising. Keep it in your tears. Come on, 
need another witness. Mm-hmm. Come on. You go through the dark, the new thing good. They say they done all they could. But don't worry about it. Give it to God. That love one has left you ain't no more. I know it hurts. Seems like all your happiness is gone. But you can't let that keep you from pressing on. Hey, I love this. Because I pray that this way fast. Good evening to everyone. Uh, and tonight, I, I uh, appreciate to having the opportunity uh, to talk to you about a shepherd's heart. Uh, I want to take our uh, lesson tonight from Mark uh, chapter 6, uh, and I want to begin at verse 33. Uh, I'm going to be in Mark chapter 6, uh, and I want to begin at verse 33. To be able to put this in context, uh, many times when we use the word shepherd, we're talking about a position in the church. Uh, but tonight I want to use that um, in, in a much broader uh, spectrum. Uh, not not the shepherd uh, or what we would refer to as an elder uh, or a, a bishop in the church, uh, but I want to talk about having a shepherd's heart, having the mentality 
of one that cares for others. Uh, beginning in Mark chapter 6 and, and beginning uh, at verse uh, 33, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people. And the Bible says he was moved. To give this in context, Jesus is there, and the people are following Jesus. And as they're following Jesus, uh, the Bible says Jesus is standing, and, and the place where he's standing, he's able to see all the people that are gathering together unto him. He hasn't started teaching yet. The only thing that he's doing, if you can imagine, uh, Jesus is standing there, and all of the people are coming together to gather at his feet. And as he's standing there, he's standing with his disciples, and he's standing there, and he's just watching the people. And the Bible says that as he's watching the people, the Bible says he's moved with compassion. I want you to notice in the text, the Bible did not say he was moved uh, with sympathy. He was not moved with empathy. The Bible says he was moved with compassion. Somebody says, Brother Williams, what is the difference between compassion uh, and sympathy? Uh, sometimes when people stand up and they say, you know what, I'm going through a difficult time in my life, uh, and I want you to pray for me. Uh, some people will have sympathy, and with that sympathy, uh, they'll write a card, and they'll send what they call a sympathy card. Uh, they, they feel emotionally bad for the person. But that's about the extent that it will go. Uh, it's not even empathy. Uh, but the Bible says that, that when Jesus was looking at these people, he was moved with compassion. Compassion is when you are emotionally moved by what you have seen or heard. But the difference between compassion and sympathy and empathy is that compassion, you are moved to do something about it. It is the difference when you're driving along and you see someone who is hungry. You have sympathy. You have empathy. You look, you emotionally feel something, you feel bad, you wish uh, their situation was different, but you keep driving. But the person who has compassion, see what they do is they stop. They pull over. They go get groceries, they, they go get food, and then they come back to that same corner and says, you know what, I'm going to do something about this person's situation. I can walk in or you can see a person walk in and tears would be in their eyes. And you can see them crying in the corner and you say, you can be walking by and saying, I, I don't know what's going on with that person. I, I hope everything works out. See, that's sympathy. But compassion. Compassion says, I see your tears, and I see your pain. And not only do I see your tears, I see your pain, but I'm going to walk over, and I'm going to do something about it. The beautiful thing about the text here in Mark chapter 6 and verse uh, 33, the Bible says, The people saw them departing many new and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and out with them, and came together unto him. The Bible says, they, they were running to Jesus, and as Jesus is standing there, he's watching them in verse 34, and Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people. And notice what the, the scripture says. He was moved with compassion. What moved Jesus? Compassion moved him. What moves you? What moves you? When you see people that do not know the gospel, when you see people and, and you see families that are hurting, people that are lost, children who do not know which way to go, people who are making bad life choices and decisions, do you just shrug your shoulders and say, well, you know, that ain't me. That's not my business. That's somebody else's. Well, people are going to do what they want to do. Listen, I don't control anybody. Or are you like Jesus? And are you moved with compassion? The Bible says he was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep having 
They were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So Jesus not only looked at them, the Bible says he was the thing that moved him was compassion. If you have compassion in your heart, which is what a shepherd has. See, a shepherd has compassion. And the Bible says that when he was moved with compassion, one of the first things he begins to do is he begins to teach them. He begins to share with them things that they do not understand. He begins to enlighten them about the word of God. And so the Bible says he begins to teach them many things. And when the day was far spent, well, what did Jesus do? He, he spent the day because his heart was moved with compassion. See, Jesus had a shepherd's heart. The reason why uh, Jesus is our great shepherd, the one that's talked about in Ezekiel uh, 34, uh, that, that uh, God says, I'm going to send a shepherd. Uh, I'm going to send uh, one who is going to take care of my people. Matter of fact, if you have the opportunity uh, to go to Ezekiel uh, chapter 34, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 34, God talks about how he was going to send a shepherd for his people. How he was going to send someone to take care uh, of his sheep. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 34 uh, and, verse, um, and verse 8. Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 8. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became prey. And my flock became meat to every beast of the field. Because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not the flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people. And gather them from the countries and bring them, them, uh, bring them to their own land and feed upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel and shall uh, and, and shall be their fold be and they shall. Uh, and there shall they lie in good fold and fat pasture. They shall feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. I will cause them to lie, lie, uh, lie down, saith the Lord God. Uh, he says, listen, I'm going, uh, the, the, the children of Israel, the shepherds that were over them, had neglected the children of Israel. And so when God looked at his people, the Bible says he was angry. Because he saw that the shepherds were only taking care of themselves. And when he looked at the people, the people were broken. They were diseased. They were hurting. They were suffering. Now, what, what good is a leader that doesn't help people to get better? What good is a leader that doesn't take you from bad to better? What good is a leader that if you come back again this same time next year, you're in a worse state? This same time next year, you're not closer to God? He says, I'm going to get rid of those shepherds because they only take care of themselves. What kind of mentality do you have? Do you only think about yourself? Is it always about you? Do you only pray for, for yourself? You're so enthralled and you're so uh, consumed with your own problems, you don't even have time to love the people that are around you. The Bible says that when we love one another, when we bear one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. Do you know that when you care for those who are in need and those who are poor and those who are broken, those who can't do for themselves, when you help those who can't pay you back? Don't you know 
That is fulfilling the law of Christ. So you have to understand that when you don't do that, you're not doing everything Christ has called you to do. If God is supplying you, it is not for you. God supplies you so that you can bless other people. So you have to understand, the more blessed you are, the bigger your your fruit basket should be. You should have testimonies all over the city of people who have been blessed by you because if God has opened up the windows of heaven to pour down on you, it was not supposed to just die with you. You are supposed to be an open vessel so that when God pours down on you, many people can come and drink of the, of, of, of the river of the Lord through you. So the Bible says here, back in Mark chapter 6, if you turn your Bibles back uh, to Mark chapter 6, and in Mark chapter 6, we said in verse 34 uh, that, that Jesus was moved with compassion, and when he saw that the people were ignorant, when he saw that these people were like sheep, but they didn't have a shepherd, he took upon himself to begin to teach them many things. The Bible says in verse 35 that he spent the day with them. Teaching them, educating them, not wanting them to be ignorant. Sometimes you have friends and you have loved ones and you have people that you say you care about, but you know they don't know God. You know that they're not aware of the things of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the Bible says, when the day was far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place. And now the time is far spent. As Jesus was teaching, as Jesus was moved with compassion to care for those who had no shepherd, there was no one in their environment who, who had the knowledge that Jesus had. So Jesus took the time to share. But isn't it funny that the people who were closest to Jesus was telling Jesus, Do you know what time it is? Was telling Jesus, we've already spent too much time here. Isn't it funny that the people who are saved are the first ones to get tired in serving those who are not saved? And the ones who are not saved are not even looking at the clock. They're consuming and eating all of the wonderful things of the word of God. Isn't it funny? That the ones who pressure the preacher to stop preaching are the people who have already tasted the blood of Jesus Christ. So the disciples come to Jesus. They interrupt Jesus. And they said, this is a desert place. And now the time is far spent. They came to Jesus with two problems. They interrupted him while he was teaching, which is which is actually the first problem. It was their first mistake. You interrupted Jesus when you should have been helping Jesus. How many times do we have ministries in our church? And the church tries to come together to do something in the community or to help others. And there's always somebody complaining about it's too early in the morning to do that. Or it's too late. Or we got something else going on. Isn't it funny that the people who are most, the people who are truly blessed, are the ones who seem to be inconvenienced the most? If you're feeding the hungry, but you're frustrated because it's too hot outside to be delivering food. Isn't it funny that the people who are full and, and fully clothed and their bellies are fed and they're warm and they're blessed to have resources, they're, they're the ones who get inconvenienced? And they they complain about the conditions. So they came to Jesus with two problems. The place that we're in is not suitable. And number two, too much time in this place. And the Bible says in verse 36, so they came to Jesus with a suggestion. Send them away. That they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread. 
for they have nothing to eat. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. They knew that the people that Jesus had compassion on and that he was teaching didn't have any money. You may ask yourself the question, how did they know that these crowd of individuals who ran out to meet Jesus were poor? They could see, they could observe. And when they see, when they saw and they observed, they said, Jesus, these people are going to get hungry. Send them away so they can buy themselves something to eat. They, they didn't have any food. So the Bible says in verse 37, he answered and said unto them, you give them to eat. And they said unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worths of bread and give them to eat? And he said unto them, how many loaves do you have? Go see. And when they knew, they said five loaves and two fishes. Notice what Jesus says. You're going to send them away to go get resources so they could feed themselves. Because they don't have any food here. Jesus turns around and says, why don't you take care of them? And they say, wait a minute. Do you really expect us to go and buy all of these people? Don't you say that to yourselves? It's not my job to take care of everybody. See, you don't have a shepherd's heart. And, and, and in order to have a shepherd's heart, you got to have faith. See, you can't even give on Sunday. When you give your offering, some of you give out of comfort. That's not on faith. Some of you give below and you give from a space that doesn't cause you to stretch. You give from a very, very comfortable place. But what if this Sunday I ask you to give? Everything you have to the Lord. You say, wait a minute. I can't do that. I need to eat. I got to pay my bills. But the just shall live by faith. We quote that scripture, but we don't live by it. The apostles were the same way. Wait a minute. You don't expect us to spend all that we have to pay and, and feed all of these people. Then how are we going to take care of ourselves? And then Jesus asked, well, well, what do you have then? And they said, all we have was five loaves and two fishes. And the Bible says in verse 39, and he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the grass and set down in the ranks by hundreds and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven. He blessed it and he broke the loaves, gave them unto the disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And he did all eat and were filled. Isn't it amazing that Jesus was not worried about taking care of the people? It's funny. The people that Jesus had to worry about was his apostles. That's who Jesus had to worry about was his apostles. Does Jesus have to worry about you? Or can he trust you to have a shepherd's heart? Can 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 he trust you? The last scripture that I that I want to go to is John chapter 21. And in John chapter 21, and I'll paraphrase for the sake of time, but in John chapter 21, Jesus is talking to Peter. And as Jesus is talking to Peter, he tells Peter, do you love me? I think that's a very sincere question. He's talking to him and says, do, do you love me? And and Peter responds in verse 15. He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus said unto him, then feed my lambs. In verse 16 of John chapter 21, he said unto him the second time. He says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Simon, Peter, do you love me? The Bible says that Jesus, that Peter responded, and he said unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said unto them, then feed my sheep. He said unto him in verse 17, he said unto him a third time, 
Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? At this point, the Bible says that Peter was grieved. He's frustrated now. He doesn't understand. Jesus, why are you asking me the same question over and over again? And the Bible says, Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him the third time, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus says, then feed my sheep. I thought that was so profound. Because Jesus is driving a point. Loving me is loving your neighbor and taking care of the people of God. The broken, the cast down, the sick, visiting the sick, the widows, the fatherless, those who don't have a support system. There are those in your congregation who have no family in the city. They're there by themselves. Thanksgiving is coming up. Who are you inviting? Who are you reaching out to? Don't reach out to people who can pay you back. Invite people who can't pay you back. Invite, invite people who had nowhere to go. Uh, matter of fact, when you see the crowd, are you moved with compassion? Do you look out over the crowd or do you only see your friends? Are you only focused on yourself? You go, you go to Bible class week in and week out and get the good word of God. Who are you inviting to come with you? Who are you studying with? When you hear their speech, does it sound like they have a shepherd? Does they, do they sound like they have someone spiritual in their life leading them closer to God? My question to you this evening. Do you love Jesus? If your answer is yes, then loving Jesus is feeding his sheep, loving his sheep, caring for his sheep. There's two ways to do that. You can do that as an official position in the church. You could be an elder and you could feed God's sheep. But there's a second way to do that, which pertains to all of us. And that is having the heart of compassion, a shepherd's heart, that when you see those who are in need, that your heart of compassion is moved, that you love on people. And I believe that is a commandment for all of us, to love Christ. Is to love a sheep. Thank you. Yeah. We'll have rest yeah. He's always 
listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show, episode 118. Yeah. Hey. 